Good evening. We're glad to have you with our Wednesday night service. Things are going to be a little bit different tonight. We're going to try and incorporate into it one of our uh, big boards. Hopefully, it'll make it easier for people to to understand what we're talking in prophecy. And I know that last week we didn't cover a great deal of detail. And my thinking was, I think we need to sometimes stop and think about why we study prophecy and what's behind it. I know that the complaint pretty often is you guys have been talking about this for a long time and nothing's happened. And that's, you know, to a certain extent that's true. But each and every time that some things have happened, we've seen the world change dramatically. And of course we have certain views that kind of predominate in everything in, in uh, American and Western Christianity. We don't see a lot of some of these areas in Eastern Christianity because it is simply if you're already under persecution, or some of these things don't seem to make sense. So we can take a minute tonight, because we are going to be taking a look at, at pre-trib and pre-wrath, and try to give you kind of an overview of what's going on in, uh, in the past. But do understand that this makes a difference in what we believe, how we stand, how we prepare. This week, I know that many of you probably are already preparing for a shortage of, of meat, dairy, products that are about to occur. Why are you doing that? Well, because we have certain signs, just like we did with the coronavirus, actually, and it totally missed them. And, and then preparing for that, and you know what the signs are, you kind of do your things differently. We picked up some rice and we picked up some beans. You can tell we're raised on the border, that's easy enough. There are things that you can do and keep around and, that are good. But you know, more than that, I think too, and I want to read, take a few minutes to read a letter that's short by, my, by the name of, by the man, of, by the name of George Eldon Ladd. Mr. Ladd is a well-known theologian of times past. Great man. He writes something, he says, there is one very sobering thought which weighs heavily upon the writer's heart. This is taken from one of his books. And he would ask his readers to share it. Many of God's people are being assured today that the rapture will take place before the tribulation and that the church will not experience those troubled, terrible days. Those who hold a different view and believe that the church will suffer in the tribulation from Antichrist have not been vocal. The author knows of a good number of outstanding Christian leaders who hold this expect expectation, but they do not wish to be quoted and they have not publicly expressed themselves. However, can we afford to be silent on this question? In light of the fact that the Word of God nowhere expressly asserts a pre-tribulational rapture, and since there is no plain affirmation that the church will be taken out of the world before the Antichrist appears, let us suppose that we are in fact in the very last days and that within a matter of months or a few years at most, God moves upon the events of world history so that suddenly a new Caesar or Mussolini or Hitler or Stalin appears who's unquestionably the Antichrist. Suppose that such, as a, such a uh, person, the incarnation of satanic power, actually gains uh, domination of the entire world as neither Mussolini or Hitler or Stalin were able to. Suppose that he uses his power to demand a worship of himself and his state upon penalty of death. Suppose that martyrs begin to fall by the hundreds of thousands, not only of Jews but particularly of Christians who will not worship the beast or receive his mark. Suppose that suddenly the people of God find themselves engulfed in a horrible persecution at the hands of the Antichrist when they've been assured repeatedly on the authority of the Word of God that this experience would never befall them. What would be the result? We leave it to the reader's imagination and certainly we dare not propagate a teaching of safety about which the Word of God is not indisputably clear. Nor should we accept the responsibility of filling the hearts of God's people with what may be a false hope and thus leave him utterly unprepared for terrible, terrible days of persecution when and if they fall. If there is the possibility the church is to suffer tribulation at the hands of Antichrist, 
We do not, those who believe it, have a God-given responsibility to do what they can to prepare the church for what may be ahead, or even, though it is a very unwelcome message. Our responsibility is to God and not to man. So we do have a responsibility, and as I, as a pastor, would foresee this and have believed since about 1995, it's true. To say to the church, all's not well. And in some areas, I think I want to compare them tonight to say that we know we need to uh, we need to take a look very carefully. If I were to ask you, do you think the COVID virus is a sign of the end times? I wonder how many would turn around and say, "Yeah, I believe that." How many would, if you were to say, you know, some of the earthquakes, some of the faults? Someone told me the other day that there are ten. Um, 10 plagues that are in the world today, including, that includes the, the uh, virus. But the locusts in Africa, all through the Middle East, up through Iran, they're on the way to Iran and to China. We might kind of smile at that, but nonetheless, the people who will suffer are not the ones who should suffer. But you know, there's a time and a place that's given in Scripture. And that time and place that's given in Scripture is really given in Daniel chapter 9. And it's such an important time because it really, you know, uh, sets the term or sets the, uh, uh, the theme for what's going on. In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 9, verse number 2, Daniel 9, 2. And I hope that maybe, you know, if nothing else, write it down. Don't forget Daniel 9, 2. Because Daniel begins to give an explanation here. He says, in the first year of, of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word, word of the Lord gave, gave to uh, Jeremiah the prophet, and that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And what we're saying here is, Daniel is reading the book of Jeremiah. You know, I hope you understand what that means. It falls in the right order. Daniel is saying, I read the book of Jeremiah. And in the book of Jeremiah, it says 70 years will be given in captivity to the Jews, which is exactly what took place. <clears throat> so we, we would have to turn around and say the warning is already there. Uh, and so it also would tell us that the warning is there and that we need to heed it. He said, I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Now, I don't want to spend much time here tonight because of necessity, but I do want you to understand that the, the, what's given here to us is what we call the 70 weeks of Daniel. And you'd have to read it, and it's, and it's a study all on its own. It's not something that we can do in one session. And it's all of its own done it a couple of times. But what basically kind of set up is that there are so many years that are given till the time of the Messiah. And Christ came exactly to the date and was died on that cross exactly at the time that Daniel said he would. This first coming was given with exactly what's in Scripture. That's the reason Simon and Anna, Anna at Christmas time, we look at that. That's the reason that they were looking for the Messiah. That's the reason that the Magi had come looking because of what Daniel had written and Jeremiah had written. And they came to, to, uh, to worship the king. Now let me just say to you that that puts down some things that we can follow and track through scripture. And that 70 weeks of Daniel is one of those that kind of gives us some ideas. You know, if you were looking at the way that we kind of break things down in, in the church. So this is man's way of looking at, uh, at the theology of, of scripture. We call it dispensations, and there is a lot of controversy on using that word, not using that word. But there are certain ways that God has dealt with men over the years. First one, of course, is up to the flood, was a, a, a pact or agreement he had with Adam. At the flood, he made a pact or an agreement with Noah after the flood. And there are certain things that changed. You say, Pastor, you're going real fast here, and I know I am. But 
I want to stay with, with God in the flow tonight. But then after the law was given to Moses on Mount Horeb, he changed everything in his relationship to one group of people, and that was the Jews. And to the Jews, he gave them a set of laws. And we want to say it's over 600 long. In all reality, it's summed up in one. Love, thy, love, thy, love the Lord thy God with all my heart, soul, and mind. His second like unto the first. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Now look, you're going to say that's in the New Testament. No, that's also in the Old Testament. There's nothing changed. There's nothing different. And that law continued up till the time that Christ died on the cross. That's just the first time that things really definitively change. Yeah, I know, we can debate some of the finer points here, but basically, that's the time when things really change. From the cross, all the way through the next 2,000 years plus, we have the church age. Scripture calls it a mystery. Something that, that we can look at and say it's, it's really not in Scripture real plain. It doesn't say outright in, in the way that we would look at it and say that the message of the gospel was going to be taken to the, Jew, uh, to the Gentiles worldwide. And we call it the church age or the mystery that's given in Scripture. And it continues, as we said, for so far 2,020 years. And I understand that this is not 2020, but it's, you know, we're going to use that. 70 AD, though, there was something that occurred that's distinctly different, and it changes things. And it's a date that even as a Christian, you need to know. But the Romans came in, and they destroyed the temple in, in the city of Jerusalem. In fact, they destroyed the temple, they destroyed the city, they killed over a million people. And it's a time and place that when you look at it, that, that changes everything for the Jew, because suddenly they lose their capital city and they lose, they lose their temple where they went to worship. And they were scattered over the world. Now they'd been already been scattered by the Assyrians to a certain point, by the Babylonians, but a lot of them came back. But now the Romans just scattered them. Once they didn't kill, they took and scattered them. DNA structure, this is another old thing to get into, but DNA structure tells us if those Jews are scattered all over the world and they were done so to take the message of the one true God out. Now he's going to deal with Israel, unsaved Israel, in a different way. But let me say one thing. When you and I become a Christian, we become a part of the Israel of God which is those Jews who have recognized Jesus as Messiah. We become brothers and sisters. You can see it in Ephesians chapter one and two. But at the end of the church age, you're gonna say, when is that? Well, I don't know. Hadn't happened yet. We will begin the time of Jacob's trouble. It's gonna go for seven years, seven years. I should have written that somewhere on here for you. But at the midpoint of that seven year period, at the midpoint, right here, there's an abomination of desolation. Something's going to occur in the temple in Jerusalem to change the status of everything. So at that midpoint, I think it's going to be that Antichrist, who is a being who is against Christ, is going to set himself up to work, be worshiped as God within the temple. That's significant. And what it means is we're halfway through that seven year period and here at the second coming, and I'm gonna tell you that this is kind of up to a little disagreement here, but at the end of seven years, Christ will return. Now whether he returns right at that point or 75 days later, we'll talk about it later and look at it. And then there will begin a thousand year reign of Christ here on earth. A thousand years, a millennium of peace, and tranquility, and life being so much different than what you and I know it to be. But when we come to a point where we start looking and saying, well, okay, what happens to Christian people? Now part of what's going on in this seven year period is God's wrath. 
book of Thessalonians, we were told, we were told that, uh, or rather in the New Testament, we were told clearly, we are not here for God's wrath. God's wrath we're, we're taken out of. And I think sometimes we kind of look to that and we want to say what we're going through now is pretty tight. You know, it's, it's been a rough month. We've had to stay home. And for a lot of people, it really has been a very tough time. And we've seen it. But the wrath of God is something entirely, entirely different. It's something that's so frightening it's hard for us to believe. And if you take a look with me for a minute at Revelation chapter 6, Revelation chapter 6, we can take a look at chapter, oh, verse number 17 in Revelation 6. And let me just read back a few places here that will be, I think, helpful. Let's go back to verse number 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sack, sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. You know, if you've ever been to Carlsbad Caverns, or one of the caverns where they turn the lights off, you can't see your hand in front of your face. And I'll tell you what, it doesn't take very long before you're saying, I want the lights. I want the lights so I can see what's going on. He's saying here, I want to turn the sun off. I don't know how that occurs. I'm not sure exactly that I could give you every detail that's here, and probably that's good. <clears throat> in verse number 13 says, the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as fig tree cast her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And I would have to probably describe that as meteors or other things that are hitting and coming into our atmosphere. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together. Every mountain and island were moved out of their places. In other words, the heavens just open up. You can do some checking because online, other places, we find men who describe this and they give exactly the reason on how this can, can occur. I'd have to tell you it's above my pay grade. I'd have to give one of my math teachers to do that for you. But nonetheless, it's a terrible time. And when the kings and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bond man and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, follow us, hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the, what? Wrath of the Lamb. And the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? Now, wrath is particular in, in this particular area of Scripture in the sense that it is, and he's already given it, it is something that is so terrible. It involves the stars in heaven, it involves the moon, it involves earthquakes, it involves everything that, that you and I have come to be fearful of. And I would tell, tell you that at that point, we're going to say, are we really going to be here for that? Is God going to leave us here for that? Or are we already going to be gone before that time comes? Yeah, I think we'll be gone. But I think the timing of it is different than what we're looking at. Because there's an awful lot here that can be said. When we look back at Revelation chapter 6, verse number 1, it says, I saw when the Lamb opened up one of the seas, and I heard, as it were, the noise of great thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw him behold a black, a white horse, I'm sorry, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and went forth conquering to conquer. Almost invariably, most of us who look at that verse say, This is the Antichrist. He's come to earth. He's a being who is against Christ. He's out to replace Christ. Now, at first, he seems to be a very good man. He's going to be, you know, duplicitous in everything that he does. And kind of the question comes here is, okay, when are we raptured? And I know that when we use this last seven years of the time that's given here, we usually want to call that the tribulation period. Now let me just tell you, it is not in Scripture ever labeled that. There is a great tribulation period that's given in Scripture. It's not the whole seven years at all. So this seven-year period is something that's been made up by 
other people's doctrine. Well, it's become such common usage that it's almost hard not to use it, but it's not there. In fact, what Daniel chapter 9 calls it is a time of Jacob's trouble. It's a time when we begin the 77s, and it's something that has to be worked out. And like I said, it's something that would only have to be covered in one session or two. And it really gives us a time frame of saying that this last seven years, the 70th week of Daniel, 70th week of Daniel, that's used as a week, but it's actually 70 years. And you need to accept what's given there because that's something that is pretty much agreed on more than that is in Scripture. 70 years a year, or seven years a year, I'm sorry. 70 weeks, but seven years. The question kind of comes is, do we escape that or do we go through this? Is this just strictly for the Jew? Well, let me ask you a question. You know, you, you kind of have to stop and think here. There's a group out there, and they call it, it's a pre-tribulation group, and they're saying that the rapture is imminent. It's something which comes without any signs, without any prelude. It, is, it can come at any time. I've got, you know, question, or uh, I'm sorry, quotation after quotation that's here. It quotes and says, there's no signs, there's nothing left to be fulfilled. Christ can return at any moment to gather his people into the air. If that's true, why don't we talk about signs? In fact, it, I, and there hasn't a day gone by in this past week when somebody's not asked me, is this, do you think this is the signs of the end time? Yeah, I think it's very possible that's true. But as much as I think that's possible it's true, it also says if there's signs, if there's things that are there, then pre-trib rapture is not true. And saying it's a secret rapture or that it comes without signs leads to a counterdiction. It really does. In fact, what's been set up, and I kind of left a break in here, what's been set up today is a, a, ses a session that, uh, or a, an idea that's been floated around now to say that that Christ comes back here somewhere, comes back here, and he brings his people up. He takes the rapture back here. And then there's a section in here, just a small section that's given where we live on this earth, apparently without the Holy Spirit, and apparently without Christ, and apparently entirely different mode than what we've had in the past. It doesn't make sense, and you know what's more important? I cannot find it in Scripture. Do you think God would come to it, to something that's this tremendous, that is this, this frightening, that is this devastating, and not tell us about it? Not war, uh, not war mankind? In fact, what generally is said is when he returns and to rapture the church pre-tribulation, that the Holy Spirit is taken out. And like I said, that means at this time frame, Right here, whatever it may be, some people say it's years, whatever it may be, but this time frame right here must be without the Holy Spirit. First off, I don't think it's the Holy Spirit which is withdrawn at all. I think there's another being to be looked at that's there. There is a group that look and say that at the midpoint there's a, a rapture that takes place here. There's a group that say it takes place right here at his second coming. And it's at the tail end of all of this. We go through the whole thing. And when they repeat that, Christians go through the whole thing. But there's a group of us that are called pre-wrath. And what we're saying is they go, we go right in here somewhere. Now I'm going to draw a circle here because I want you to understand. I don't know the day. I don't know the hour. Okay, I don't know the day or the hour. And you will tell me, yeah, Pastor, that's because it comes like a thief in the night. And yes, it does come like a thief in the night. But you need to read the two verses in Thessalonians that are also in there. Those two verses say, it should not catch us, meaning believers, as a thief in the night. Why would it say that? Why would it give this? In fact, in this case, all of a sudden, the signs and all, they make sense. They really do. They make sense. They're telling us we need to be prepared for this time. 
we're given some time to do the things that we need to do and to, <clears throat> to be ready to defend ourselves or die. I don't see any place in Scripture where we're really told to defend ourselves, but I'm sure that will be a part of it. it tells us to flee. There is a group, and I need to mention it before I forget about it, but there's a group back here that feel like all the prophecy that's given in Scripture is filled back here in the back. But 70 AD, when the Romans destroyed everything, and in fact, they even say at 70 AD, Christ returns. <clears throat> I've got the man who's doing the videos who's kind of shaking his head because it's the first time you've heard that. It's a good, good sized group of them, preterist. And they believe that Christ returned back here to 70 AD when the Jews were uh, dispersed. And they honestly believe that the church took the Jews' place and that the Jews were dispersed and Christ returned and the bodies were raised and life continues up until some point in time where things get better and Christ comes back. I have to tell you, if we're getting better, we must have been really bad in the past. I see nothing that tells me we're getting any better. In fact, if anything, I see that we have the potential now to do exactly what we see in Scripture about historic or something. So we're going to kind of just ignore that, the prayers to you. There's a group out here that really don't believe there's any of this occurs. And all of the prophecies given, the rest of the Scriptures and Book of Revelation, all of those are fulfilled. They're fulfilled back, again, back in 70 A.D. And that, in essence, we will live, and as I said, till we get better and Christ returns. Mankind changes. But more logically, in regards to some of the things that we may disagree on, more logically is, is, is the fact that at this 70th week of Daniel, time of Jacob's trouble, is what we've tried to label it. At that seven-year period, <clears throat> things begin to happen, and we know that Christ is about to return. He even tells us, you know, I have a fig tree in the backyard. It's not real productive. If I do what Christ does with a fig tree in there, it's about ready to come out. But it's only two years old, so we're going to leave it alone and see what happens. But you know, my point is, when I begin to see the, the figs come on that tree, and it's really loaded with them, but when I see those figs come on that tree, I begin to look for them to ripen. Something is going to happen. You can do it with figs, you can do it with tomatoes, you can do it with anything, but you know there's certain things that you're looking for to know it's, it's about time for it to happen. We do the same, very same thing with the weather. We know there's certain things that did occur. I can tell you now today, at 90 some odd degrees in the last couple of days, I know it's about to occur, and so do you. It's gonna get hot. So we become miserable and we're going to go through our three months of uh, summertime. It's the same way here. I see it looking around to me and I see what I see and, and it's going on in the world. I see three great powers. Three great powers. Not one, but three great powers. Throughout history, that's always been a problem. Always. And apparently, that's also going to be a problem now. But the big thing is, regardless of the problem that may occur because of this, I can look forward and see what's going to happen. It's given to me. The warning is given to me. Yep, it concerns me because of my kids, my grandkids, great-grandkids, all my family. It concerns me because of the church. It concerns me because of my friends. It concerns me because of people who need to be one to Christ. All those things are part of it. But somebody's right. Either we're gone here at this point, or we're going to be gone, I think, down here. You see, Pastor, I don't like yours, and I don't like mine either. I, I'm hopeful they're right, but I don't see anything in Scripture that says that. You know, if in fact, if you take a look at one of those common things they say is, how come the church is, word church is not given anywhere in Scripture after a certain point in the book of Revelation. Or it's not given anywhere in Revelation. If you'll turn with me for a second to uh, Revelation chapter 1, we'll take a look. Revelation chapter 1. How many words can you think of for the church? 
I mean, words kind of describe the church. What, what kind of words are you, you know, do you, what do you look out for the church? Well, how about believers? Followers. I mean, throughout, the, throughout history, we've had any, any number of words, but he starts in Revelation chapter 1, verse number 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show unto his, what? Servants. Things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified by his angel unto his servant John. Now he goes ahead to talk about that, but also on, on uh, <clears throat> verse number three, blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of his prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. And he says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from which from him which is in which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Let me tell you, in Hebrew, if this is translated into Hebrew, this is the same phrase that's used in Exodus, I am that I am. I read this once in Hebrew to a friend of mine in Israel, an Israeli woman, been a good friend, and I was practicing my Hebrew, and she picked it open, I had to pick open my Bible and said, read this, so I did. Took me a long time to get it all out, but I began to read it, and when I got down to it, it says, from him which is, which was, which is to come, she began to holler at me, but they scream at me. It was blasphemy. Because what I just did, she understood it. I just made Jesus Christ God. That's exactly what this is saying. I don't care what language it's in, it's just in Hebrew, it happens to have certain meaning, which is significant. In verse 5 it says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that, that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Just think about that for a second. The mother loved us so much, he died for us. His body was broken. His blood was shed. That blood covers us and washes us clean, washes us white as snow. And it does so to change us completely. He says he's made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and ever I shall see him. And they also which pierced him to choose, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. You know what he's saying here is, the whole earth is going to see him on his return. Now wait a minute. Does that match a secret rapture? where nobody sees the people that are taken up? Or just give us something which is entirely different? By the way, this matches with Matthew chapter 24. It's going to match with something that we're going to see a little bit later <clears throat> down here in the in, uh, book of Revelation. It's going to match with what Isaiah says, what Jeremiah says. And I wish I had time to go back and pull all these up because there's, there's a, when we're looking at the day of his wrath or day of his coming, there's 2,500 references to it. Almost invariably, anytime you see that word spoken, that word is talking about this time. His coming. And it's always, always with great signs. Not hidden. It's not a dog whistle rapture. You know what a dog whistle rapture is? You know, you've seen it advertised on the papers you see it used and it's a dog whistle rapture as you blow a whistle hurts the dog's ears he can hear it but your neighbor can't hear it you can't hear it nobody else can hear it it's just a dog it's a dog whistle rapture that's not what's shown here he cometh through clouds clouds that's believers and it may be angels but he comes with clouds no he comes with just people and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. It's not a secret rapture. This is clearly open. Now let me just tell you, I think that the event that he's talking about, he's down here. But nonetheless, he's coming. And you might say, Pastor, you got the rapture here, and the second coming here. Frankly, 
frankly, the way that it reads in Scripture, all this is occurring almost simultaneously. We're going up. I'm not sure why this thing is not writing for me, but we're going up, and he's coming down. At this point in time, though, we're joined with him in the air. We're giving our new bodies down here. If you look very plainly in Scripture, we're giving our new bodies down here. It's not in the middle of the air. What was Christ giving his new body? When he ascended, or did he already have it? He already had it. And I think it's the same way here. I'm not sure exactly all the details here, and I can't fill them in because I don't want to go beyond Scripture, but it's pretty plain. We get them right here. We get them right here on the earth, and then we're taken up, as well as those who have died <clears throat> or who are uh, still alive left at the end. And the second coming is fulfilled as he begins to come, not totally returning to the earth, but he comes back. There's a good reason for, me, for my saying that, because he's actually showing coming in three different places, not just from out of bottles as we've usually almost always been told. But starting in verse number two, or chapter number two, I'm sorry. And it's about the seven churches, seven local churches. And he begins to use the term church because he would, he's writing to the local church, number one in Ephesus. And he goes down the line to these seven different churches, which existed at the time John was writing this. And John's the only apostle who lives a normal um, life and who dies without being a martyr. Now, I want to tell you, they tried to kill him, apparently, from what we see. I don't have it in Scripture, but it's in church history. They tried to kill him in different ways, and they could not. So they exiled him to Patmos. And on the island of Patmos, he writes this revelation. So, he, you know, each time that he writes this, he talks about the church at Ephesus, the church at Laodicea, the church at Smyrna. One at church at Smyrna sometime, you need to take a close look at their history and see when they cease to exist because it's in this century. Then it comes by the, the hand of Muslims to wipe out the church. And smart. You know, when I look at this, I understand that would be a logical word to use because it's the church at Smyrna, church at Ephesus. But it's really, the whole book is written, and these are used as examples, the whole book is written to the servants of Christ, to the brothers of Christ, to the believers. And when those words are used in, in the rest of the New Testament, or sometimes in the Old Testament even, because the same word saints is used in the Old Testament, regardless of when he says this, he's actually using that term towards men and women who are solid, strong believers. And I, you know, I would pray that you look very carefully at what's being written. Because in Revelation chapter 19, he's going to come back and say again, these things are written to the servants of God. What, what, what else would you expect? That he's speaking to the local church in Laodicea or Philadelphia or one of those, he would use the term church. Even like he used in book of Acts chapter 20, he uses the church in Ephesus. He would use the church in Philadelphia. But when he's looking at the whole group, he would be using the term believers or servants. What's wrong with using the term servants towards Christians? That's what we are. We are his servants. Yeah, the church is not in uh, Revelation chapter 4. It's not in Revelation chapter 5. You say, well, it's not in Revelation chapter 6. Well, let's take a look. Wouldn't you know it? Revelation chapter 6. Verse number nine says, when he'd opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they had held. 
And they cried with a loud voice, saying, O Lord, O Lord, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto them, every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest kept for a little season until their fellow servants and also and their brethren that they should be killed as they were and should be fulfilled. Now, wait a minute. There's a couple of words here too. It's fellow servants. Brethren. You know a lot of times around the church we use that term brother and sister. Then well we should because we are of the family of God. Servants. That also agrees with what the book starts with. Use it again. But these souls, they don't have bodies yet. Where'd they come from? Where do they come from? And what he does is, it, at this particular point, is he gives them the white robes that they're going to use later. They're passed out. Now, do they come from this supposed separation here of people that are killed? Is this where they, they come from? You know, you, you're beginning to see that there's some contradictions. How many raptures do you see in Scripture? Well, I've never been to five one. And it's real logical and, and, and looped in the book of Matthew and the book of Revelation. Just one. When he sends his angels to harvest. So where'd they come from? And there's somewhere down in this area. They're underneath that altar. And the reality of it is at this point you have to say, okay, are they raptured? Because you know what? In Revelation chapter 7, in Revelation chapter 7, they show up with bodies. And they have white robes on. And the rapture is taking place. And we'll go through this a little bit later, but it makes good sense. By the way, all the chronology that's given here is also given in Matthew chapter 24. And they follow each other. It's also given in Daniel and Jeremiah and several different places that you look at. <clears throat> and what we're saying simply is all of this occurs at the middle of that midpoint and the rapture there takes place. But when we're raptured, God's wrath is poured out at that point. And by the way, that fits with scripture because in Matthew chapter 6, that tail end of Matthew chapter 6 is all about his wrath. And it says, now is his wrath come. I know we get into the Greek here, we begin to, to argue and fight about it, but you know what? It's pretty plain. Now, now, now his wrath becomes. It hasn't come beforehand. It hasn't even started beforehand. Now it comes. And suddenly, we find that we've gone through a large section of this. We've gone through the Antichrist. We've gone through the persecution. Many people have died. Pastor, I don't like this. I told you before, I hope I'm wrong. I just don't think you can prove it. I am. Secret rapture? I'm not trying to be... Uh, or to use the term is wrong, but it is a dog whistle rapture. And it's it's just something that Christ has, God has never done before. Whatever he did, he openly does it. On the flood, in the days, as in the days of Noah, so shall it come be as in the days of my coming. Did they know it was coming? He's building an ark. And as it starts to rain, he actually calls them on into the ark. But he doesn't in any way, shape, fashion, or form, leave them without a warning. And we need to understand and see that's the same way here. You can see the signs. Building, building, building. One man wrote the other day, and it was, I thought it was kind of fascinating with him. He, he, uh, he, the same reason that, I, I don't know, I, I was just kind of fascinated with the fact that everybody rushed out and bought toilet paper. I understood the water, I understood a lot of those things, but toilet paper, I can understand up to a point, but not, not like we did. But this man put down very quickly in one of the articles, and you know what, it's very true, he said, but however, the toilet paper is not going to save you 
from the super volcano that's in Yellowstone that's beginning to move. Toilet paper's not gonna save you from a thousand other things that God could use. For as long as I've been in this pulpit, I have said all along, you can always see the United States fall in minutes, in hours. As mighty as we are, and here this time we have seen God use something which is invisible to us to topple us and bring us to our knees and put us in a situation that we have not seen since the 1930s. Can I suggest to you, if you're a pre-tripper and maybe you're getting ready to get angry at me and write me a note, before you write me a note, do some checking. Do some checking. If you believe he's coming as a, as a thief in the night, and we go back to uh, Thessalonians, And you look at Thessalonians chapter 1, <clears throat> verse number 8, inflaming fire, take inventions on them that know not God, and then obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. It's not a matter of the rapture. What really matters is where will you spend eternity? Who do you put your faith and trust in? Because the idea is when, verse number 10, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all of them that believe, because our testimony among you is believed in that day, you have to look and say, where will you be on that day? Will you admire him and glorify him, or is it going to be a day that you look forward to this one of fear and one of trembling? I think sometimes it's so hard. We get into some of the, some of the debates that we get into without ever doing <clears throat> this study. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except, right off the bat, he set the stage for something that's different, except there first come a falling away, and that man of sin be revealed in the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself with all that's called God and that's worship so that he is God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. I believe that's the midpoint. That's the abomination of desolation given by Daniel and given by Christ. And he told him, he said, you know, remember you not that when I was with you, yet with you I told you these things? I'm not trying to put fear in your mind. I'm trying to just give you a warning about what's coming of what, uh, what is very possible. And without going into all the things that I've heard in the past few weeks about what it could be and what it cannot be, I'm not concerned about it because I don't need them. <clears throat> in another place in the book of Thessalonians, he talks again about us not being caught. He does not catch us as a thief in the night. You can say, Pastor, no man can know the day or the hour. I, I, get, I get that. You know, I have a, a, a man who's in the church here for many years. He'd been a prisoner of war, a German prisoner of war camp for 24 months almost. And he said, you know, there was a day and a time when they could hear the Russian army getting closer and closer and closer. He said they, they knew what was going on. They were preparing to ship them out, and all of a sudden they got up one morning and all the German guards were gone. They left. He said the first thing they saw was Russian vehicles coming into the camp. And the Russians were stunned, and the men and women who were prisoners there, they were caught during this time. They were overjoyed. Overjoyed. You know, I say, well, it was the Russians. You know what? At that point, they didn't care. They were pleased. In our case, there's coming a day and time when Christ is going to appear to us suddenly. I don't know whether I will see this in my flesh or you know, as a thief. I mean, I'm sorry, as a spirit. But either way that it comes, and however it happens, I'll be looking forward to that day. 
when he returns so that I can worship him in truth, in spirit and truth. Please check things. Don't just accept what's written. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, Father, for your love and your mercy. Help us to read scripture and to see, Father, what it says. And Father, to follow it, not the things of man, man, but the things of God, that we follow your word and we follow your, uh, your instructions. And we ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen.